Mark chapter 7. When you find that, those of you that are willing and able, would you stand with us as we read some scripture together? Mark chapter number 7. And we're going to start reading in the 31st verse, Mark 7 and verse number 31. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came unto the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and saith unto him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it, and were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. And I want to preach to you out of verse 37 for a little while this morning. And he hath done all things well. Pray with me and for me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for meeting us here this morning in the, in the music and the worship. Lord, it's, it's always a blessing. It's a blessed thought to to think that you would receive worship from people like us, that you would, uh, that, you would, that you would enjoy our voices and you would enjoy us praising your name as undeserving as we are. Lord, it is a blessed thought to think that you would receive worship from us. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you for being the good shepherd. Lord, I'm, I'm so grateful for your leadership. God, if I had led myself, I would... I would be an absolute disaster. God, thank you for being so good to me. Thank you for being good to this church. Lord, I I ask now as we come to this text, Lord, this group of people have testified that you have done all things well. Lord, I pray you give us the wisdom to see it how they see it. Because out of honest hearts, we have to say at times that we don't think you've done good or done right. Everything doesn't always seem well. It isn't always well. God, you have done everything well. God, help us, give us wisdom to see how this group of people saw what you've done. I ask that you strip us down to just ourselves, all superficial, outside appearances, all fake things. All masks, God, I pray we take them off. All things that mean nothing, all things that are hollow and and feign, I pray that all those are gone. Lord, now it is us and your word. God, we are as Adam, we are but dust. David said that you know of our frame that we are but dust. God, I pray that as, as you did in the Garden of Eden, Lord, would you take your hands... Put it on the dust and touch us and then breathe into us something holy, something helpful and something from heaven. God, would you give us what we need? God, would you touch our minds and give us wisdom where we are confused? You touch our hearts and give us healing where we are wounded. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Lord, the countenances of so many in the pews are so empty, so dry. And so scarred, I pray you help them this morning. I pray you help them. May everybody leave church this morning after receiving what they needed most. I pray you help us in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. And Amen. You can be seated. Well, a group of people have just made one of the most astounding testimonies of Jesus that anyone's made in the history of the world. He hath done all things well. 
He hath done all things well. That is not something easy to say at all times. It is always true. It is always the right thing to say, but there are times where it is very hard to see it that way. I'm trying to preach to some honest people. I'm being honest with you. I hope you can be honest with me. And let's be honest with the Word of God. Listen, as I pray, it ain't time to fake it. It ain't time for facades, and it's not time for masks. You ain't here to impress me. I'm not here to impress you. And quite frankly, I don't think anybody here has been impressed yet. Listen, this is about us getting a breath or a word from God's Bible. Listen, we need to hear from God. Let's quit faking it. Church has got too many facades, got too many actors, got too many actresses. This isn't about a play. This isn't about somebody's name unless it's Jesus. And listen, let's just be honest with ourselves. Sometimes it's hard to say that God's done all things well. Sometimes it's hard to say that and mean it. Oh, it's easy to say it in church because you're supposed to. It's easy to sing God's been good. It's easy to sing that because it's pretty and it rhymes and it's easy to just go along with the notion but deep down into the core of your heart, He knows if you mean it. And as these people testified, He hath done all things well. What a blessed truth. That they did not testify, they did not confess this until after it was all over. There's already been a great miracle taking place. And I will remind you that, that, that they didn't say it before, they said it after. They didn't say it before he performed the miracle. They didn't say it during the miracle. They said it at the end of the miracle. At the end, he brought all things together for good. At the end, he brought it all full circle. At the end, he restored the health to this man. When it was over, he had finished it, and they could praise his name for it. And maybe you've just come off of something, and you can stand and say he's done all things well. Maybe you're looking back on a time of life where you can say he's done all things well. But maybe you're not in verse 37 yet. Maybe you're still in verse 32, verse 33. And I want to help you to praise by faith. And he hath done all things well. I want you to notice this man. They've brought unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And as they praised him later, they said that he, hath, he maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. And they brought him to Jesus for they asked him to touch him, to heal him. And Jesus performs this miracle and he has now done what they could not do. They could not heal his ears and they could not heal his tongue and Jesus has done what they could not do. And I don't know if that means anything to you or not, but it sure is a blessing when God does for me what I cannot do for myself. And it is a blessing when God does for somebody what I cannot do for them. It is a blessing and it is a miracle and it is a gift from God when He does something that we cannot do ourselves. It is a blessing when God does something that we cannot do ourselves. They have brought this man. You understand, this man doesn't have a clue what's going on. He cannot hear. He cannot be told we are taking you to a man named Jesus who performs miracles and can heal people and can raise the dead and heal lepers and touch blinded eyes and deaf ears. He cannot hear those things. He does not know what is going on. When they bring him to Jesus, he's just a normal man like everybody else. He has no idea who he's been brought to. Much like our children, we bring them to Jesus, we bring them to church, and maybe, maybe now they don't yet understand everything. And it is a blessing when God does for somebody what we cannot do for them. I don't know a parent in the room that wouldn't get saved for their child. I don't know a parent in the room that wouldn't answer their child's prayer if they had the ability. I don't know a parent in the room that wouldn't move heaven and earth for their own child, but we have to admit our shortcomings. We have to admit our limits, that there are things that we would do for others, but we just can't do them. And it's a blessed gift from heaven when God does for somebody what we cannot do for them. 
this man's been healed. and He cannot do that for himself. And it is an equal blessing when God does for you what you can't do for you. He's not only done what they could not. In verse 33, things do get rather strange. And he puts his fingers into his ears and he spit and touched his tongue. Well, he's not only done what they could not, now he's done what they would not. If that's the combination to this man's, if if that's the remedy, I don't know that people are going to line up to do something so awkward and so strange. These deaf and dumb people were considered by the rabbis less than human because they... There was no way to know what they understood, so they had no rights. They were basically treated as animals they, because there was no way of knowing what they could or could not understand. And, and so they were basically treated as animals. And they've besought Jesus to touch him. And he's done for them now what they would not. But as Jesus Christ performs this miracle... And they walk away saying, He hath done all things well. He has done what we could not do. He's even done what we would not do. I don't need a bunch of amens right here, but God doesn't always do things the way we would. He doesn't always do things the way we would, but He always does things well. Though He may not always do them the way we would do them, He always does it well. He's never done a bad job. He always does it wholly and completely. He always does it thoroughly and perfectly. And He always does it on time. And and though it may not be how you would have done it, He always does it well. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Well, I find some things that Jesus does very well in this passage that I, I think are a blessing that I want to give you this morning. In verse 32, it says, They bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude. I want to say first thing that Jesus does well is he accepts sinners. He accepts sinners. They have brought him a man that cannot speak to him and cannot hear him. Please, I'm not being ugly, but they, Brother Stephen, they've brought him a man that's useless. They've brought him glory. They've brought him a man that cannot serve him. They've brought him a man that, mm, that can't be a blessing to him and cannot be a blessing to others. They have brought him a miserable man. They have brought him a lonely man. They have brought him somebody that society says is not much more than an animal. But Jesus, when they bring him, when they brought him to him, he said, okay, I'll take him, and takes them off to the side by himself. Hey, what a good God to accept sinners that don't mean anything and don't amount to much and are much more than an animal. Oh, I know you're pious, and you think God got a great deal when he got you, but I'll be honest with you, the day he saved me, he didn't get very much, but he accepted this sinner, and he's done all things well. He accepts sinners well. Bless His holy name. Accepting sinners well. Oh, there's times people come to church and and they walk into a holy building and are, are surrounded by holy people that are that are dressed right and got their life together and and they. They begin to feel so out of place and they begin to feel so judged even, even, even though the, the people that are there aren't judging them. They love them and they want them there and, and they are glad the sinner has come to church but the devil gets in their mind and begins to tell them, you're not as good as them. Look at them folks in the choir. You're not like them. Look at the vehicles they pulled up in. Look at the family that they have. Look how perfect their marriage is. Look how wonderful their children are and look how pitiful you are. You don't mean anything and you're nothing. You don't belong here. Church ain't for people like you. It's for the wealthy and it's for the successful and it's for the wise. It's not for you. I've got news for you, my friend, that God accepts sinners. I don't care how much money you have or don't have. I don't care if you're married or been divorced a thousand times. Jesus accepts sinners well. He accepts sinners. Don't listen to that lie from the devil 
that tells you you don't belong, that tells you that you're not worthy of salvation. The book of Ephesians talks about us being accepted in the beloved. What a blessed truth it is to be accepted by Christ. I love what he does in verse 33. He took him aside from the multitude just to let him know, I'm not accepting you for them. I'm accepting you for you. Oh, he may have died for the sins of the whole world. But when he saved you, he wasn't saving the world. He was saving you. And the day that I got saved, he wasn't saving the whole world. He was just saving Levi Wyatt. And the day you got saved, he pulled you aside from the multitude, from the vast masses of humanity. And he singled you out. And he loved you. And he forgave you. And he set you free. He accepted him personally, individually. He took him aside from the multitude. Oh, what a blessed, loving Lord. Oh, what grace. What grace. You see, he could have done it on the spot in front of him, in front of everybody, and the result would have been the same. He could have, set him, he could have healed him right there. But he adds this great personal touch by taking him aside to make it just one on one. It's not for show. Jesus wasn't, Jesus wasn't trying to show off. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to make a name for himself. He wasn't, trying to, he wasn't trying to gain followers or be more popular. This was His motive was pure. His motive was holy. His motive was godly. And His motive was, was of love. And He pulls this man aside as if to say, if you were the only person here... I would heal you. Oh, what love. He hath done all things well. He accepts sinners well. In verse 33, once he pulls him aside, he, he puts his fingers into his ears and spit and touched his tongue. Well, that's odd. Those of you that have read the Gospels a couple of times, you are familiar with Jesus' miracles, and he often would... Would, would, would heal somebody with the word of his mouth or with the, we would touch their hand or, or he would even heal somebody who wasn't even there. He'd be in a different location and would just say it and it would happen. And he, but here he, he heals this man in such a strange method, in such an unpredictable way. And I, this is not the message this morning, but don't put Jesus in a box. Look, you ain't got one big enough. Y'all remember the Taco Bell commercials with the little chihuahua? Y'all remember that? I think I need a bigger box. You don't have a box big enough to put the Son of God in. You don't have... Don't, look, take... Mm, get rid of the box. I guarantee you, no one expected this. When they said, touch him, I bet you they weren't thinking, put your finger in his ear and then put your finger in his mouth. They weren't expecting that. And I bet that's what they did. I bet they started giggling and laughing. Like, what? 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 <laughs> that is odd. That's kind of embarrassing. Like, what? There it is, supposed to be this Messiah, this miracle-working, you know, prophet and touching a man's ear. And though it was probably so strange to everyone else that saw it, it made perfect sense to this man. Because he not only accepts sinners well, he communicates to sinners well. He communicates to sinners well. As Jesus put his hands in his ears, his fingers in his ears, as if to say, I know what's wrong. I, I know that you can't hear me. I, it's like he wrote his own dialect of sign language and and he put his fingers in his ears as if to say that I, I know you can't hear what I'm saying and if you see my mouth move, I know you don't know what I'm saying and you don't have any idea what's going on. The guy's probably terrified. He is probably afraid. He doesn't know why there's so many people and what's happening. It's probably got them all worked up. But Jesus puts his fingers in his ears to let him know that I know what the problem is. Can I say that Jesus always knows what the problem is? He always knows what the problem is, and he knows exactly what needs to be done. He knows the combination 
to every complication. He knows the combination to every complication. And he touched his ears. And then he spit and touched his tongue. Not Christ's tongue. He touched the man's tongue, I believe. As if to say, I know that you can't tell me anything. And I know that I know that there are words in your heart, but you can't get them out. The Bible says that he had an impediment of his speech and that once he was healed, he could speak plainly. So he could make a noise, but he could not articulate words. How many of you understand what I'm saying? And so basically all the man was able to do was mumble or groan. And I believe as Christ put his finger on the man's tongue, it was saying, I know what the groans mean. The book of Romans talks about how the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. As we, we have these groanings in our prayers that, that can't be uttered and the Holy Spirit understands what, we're, what our groans mean. And, and Jesus is communicating to this man that he knows what's wrong. And I would tell you this morning that Jesus knows what's wrong. He knows the problem. And he knows what's the matter. He understands. He communicates to sinners well. Verse 34, the Bible says, And looking up to heaven, he sighed. And looking up to heaven, he sighed. Jesus healed many people and performed many miracles without sighing. He did many things without sighing, but for this man, as he looks up to heaven, he sighed. He's got his hands on this man. He looks up to heaven where the Father is, and he sighs. He exhales. He shows deep emotion. Can I say that as he sighed, I believe... He was relating to this man. And the third thing that Christ does well is he relates to sinners well. He relates to sinners. Before he ever prayed to his father, before he said anything to God in heaven, he sighed. Before he set him free, he related to him. Before he healed him of what was wrong, before he delivered him from his problem, he related to him. Before he engaged this heavenly world, he related to this earthly world. Is that not what Christ Jesus done at Calvary? Do you understand that all the days that Jesus lived, from the day he was born in Bethlehem to the day he died on Calvary, that didn't save us. No miracle that he performed saved a single sinner. The gospel would be the same without walking on the water, without feeding the 5,000, without feeding the 4,000, without healing those 10 lepers, without opening blinded eyes of Bartimaeus, without raising Jairus' daughter, without ever healing that woman with the issue of blood, without ever casting out those demons of the demoniac man in Mark chapter 5, and on and on the list goes. You could take all of those miracles out and it would not impact the gospel. Wouldn't change the gospel at all. But it does give us how Christ relates to mankind. He relates to man because he's lived as a man. And above all, Jesus knows more than anybody what it's like to be misunderstood. And here this man lives and he can't get his words out. 
He can't get to what he's thinking and what's in his heart and what's in his head. He can't get it out into the ears of others. What did Jesus say over and over and over again? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He said it all the time because nobody would listen to him and they always misunderstood what he meant and they always were against his words and they never quite understood. Even the 12 disciples had to pull him aside after every parable and say, hey, what did you mean by that? Can you, can you say that again? Can you, can you break that down for us? Because we don't really get it. And Jesus knows what it means to be misunderstood. And as he puts his hands on this man, as he looks up to heaven and sighs, he's relating to him. And before Christ ever set us free, he related to us. In Job chapter 9, as Job is lamenting all that he's going through, all of his hardship, he said, oh, that they were a daysman that could put his hand on both of us. Just turn over there to Job chapter 9. I want you to see it. It's a beautiful verse. Job 9, right before the book of Psalms. Job 9, look in verse 30. He said, If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean... Yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch, and mine own clothes shall it pour me. Job's in a ditch. He says, For is he not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment? Neither is there any day's man betwixt us that might lay his hand upon both of us. He said, I've got nobody that can put his hand on God and put his hand on me. You know what he said, Brother Stephen? He said, there are people that can relate to me, but they can't relate to God. And if there's somebody that can relate to God, but they can't relate to me, there's nobody in between. There's no days man. There's no mediator. But as Christ put his hands on this man, looked up to heaven and sighed, he relates to the man, but he relates to God because he is God in the flesh. And he is both, he is both the son of man and son of God. And he can relate to you, but he can relate to God. It doesn't do anybody any good if they can just relate to you, but not relate to God. For crying out loud, anybody could probably relate to this man. They could probably find thousands of them that have speech impediments or have deaf ears. He wouldn't have any problem finding somebody that can relate to him as a man. But finding someone that can relate to him as God. Oh, that changes everything. Oh, that changes everything. What a blessed thing. He hath done all things well. He accepts sinners. He communicates to sinners. He relates to sinners. Miss Leslie, can you come? I do want you to see verse 37. They were beyond measure astonished. He does all things well beyond measure. Do you know what you do when you measure something? Brother William, when you're working, building a house, when you measure a piece of wood, you know what you do? You put a beginning of it and an ending to it. You give it a start and you give it a finish. Mm. I don't know if you're getting what I'm laying down. When you measure something, you put a beginning to it and you put an ending to it. You determine it's this tall, it's this wide. Mm. You put depth to it. You put height to it. You put width to it. When you measure something, you put a beginning and an ending to it. But when they said Jesus has done all things well, they said it's not even measurable. There's no beginning to how good he is. And there's no ending to how good he is. He's done all things well beyond measure. David said in Psalms 147 that God's understanding is infinite. Infinite. You know what infinite means? It means it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. It transcends any place. Whether he's in the eastern hemisphere in Palestine or Jerusalem, he understands everything there. Bring him over here to the western hemisphere where you've got a bunch of backslidden carnal Americans. He understands this. No matter where he goes in the world, no matter where he is in time, his understanding is infinite. He does all things well beyond measure. It's not just beyond measure. He does all things well beyond man. 
The verse doesn't say that all things are well. Because that wouldn't be true. But it says he hath done all things well. And that is always true. Because man cannot do all things well. Man cannot be a great husband all the time. Man cannot be perfect. Women cannot be perfect. But Christ does all things well. He does beyond measure and beyond man all things well. It's beyond measure. It's beyond man. Lastly, it's beyond mistake. It's beyond mistake. He hath done all things with no mistakes. He hath done all things and not one mistake. Scott, can you believe that? That's all, that, 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 is a, that is a doctrine that is almost hard to believe. Looking at how bad things are. Looking at how bad some of your lives are. And you look back and you see all the heartache. You see all the pain. You see all the misfortune. And sometimes it's even hard to say that God's never made a mistake. But, but, but may I tell you... On the authority of this Bible, he's done all things well, and he's not made a single mistake. He does all things well beyond measure, beyond man, beyond mistake. I want to encourage you. No matter what, he hath done all things well, and like them, you may not have the wisdom to see it until it's over. You may not have the wisdom to see it until it's finished. I want to help you just praise Him on credit. I want to help you worship Him by faith. Not by fruit, but by faith. And trust that He's never been wrong. And trust that He does all things well. And right now, you're not looking retrospectively at it. You're not looking forward or backward. You're looking forward. Right now, you're beholding it through a glass darkly, and you can't see the wisdom of God yet. But just know that He's done all things well beyond mistake. And he's never failed. Let's stand. He hath done all things well.